and welcome to High School Physics Explained. And today I'm going to do a brief introduction to the concept of ultrasound. If you're in America, it's often referred to as a sonogram. In particular, I'm going to refer to a concept called acoustic impedance. So let's get started. And as you can see in front of me, I have four pictures of ultrasounds. If you're familiar with ultrasound in terms of their medical uses, you know that they're being used often to look at preterm babies. And so here we have four pictures of my children, in fact. Let's uh, not concentrate too much on my children, but more in terms of the features of the ultrasound image. First thing that strikes you is the gradation between light and dark. So ultrasound images traditionally are black and white. Secondly, if you know anything about what you see, you can see that areas that are brighter is what we traditionally would see as bone and denser material. And so that's important. Uh, the third thing you probably also notice that if there isn't much substance there, then the image is particularly dark. And next, I'd like you also to recognize the fact that we don't have a high resolution image here. It's not like you can see extreme detail. And finally, if you notice that all these images have this classic arc shape. So if I were to trace out that arc, it would go from there to there. And you can see what we're getting is this sort of fan shape. And that's true for all of these images here. So there are a couple of features that in the course of studying ultrasound, you'll understand why all of those things are true. But let's move on a little bit further in terms of where do we start in understanding how ultrasounds work? Well, first, let's review. And here's a couple of questions I want you to think about. Feel free to pause the video briefly and answer these questions. And then what we'll do is we'll make sure we've got the groundwork to continue our discussion. So the first question, of course, is what is a sound? And sound, of course, is a wave, and it is a longitudinal wave. And of course, longitudinal wave is where we have regions of refaction and compression, and the particles vibrate in the same line as the wave. Secondly, what are the characteristics of a wave? Well, characteristics of waves is that it has a wavelength. It has a frequency. And it has a speed. And these three particular characteristics we're going to be spending a little bit of time on. Of course, wavelength and frequency and speed are all related in that that is the speed is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. Of course, the frequency is the number of cycles per second and the wavelength is the length of one complete cycle. What is the meaning of ultrasound? Well, a quick review again, sonic basically means sound. So ultrasound is basically a sound above human hearing. Now, human hearing is anywhere from 20 hertz right up to 20,000 hertz. Now, generally speaking, most adults probably don't even hear up to 20,000 hertz, maybe around 14 or 15,000 hertz, but that is traditionally the range at which human hearing exists. Any sound that has a frequency below that is often referred to as infrasonic. And any sound that is above 20,000 hertz is often referred to as ultrasonic. And that's important in terms of our ultrasound because the sound waves that are generated in ultrasounds or sonograms are in the order of around 2 million hertz. So clearly that's well beyond the hearing range. And in another video, I will talk about the piezoelectric effect of how that sound is actually generated at such a high frequency. Finally, how can a sound wave's velocity be varied? You know that the frequency and the wavelength determine the velocity. Then generally speaking, as long as the medium remains constant, then altering the frequency or also the wavelength, the speed doesn't change. And that is the key as to how we can vary the sound wave's velocity, and that is by altering the media. So traditionally, sound in air travels approximately 340 meters per second. Whereas, for example, in steel, it can travel up to 5,000 meters per second. So the medium that the sound travels through will affect the speed of the wave. So here we have, of course, different media. And you can see here there is a relationship between the speed of that sound wave in that medium and the density. As we go down, we can see that the speeds are increasing. Uh, and here, of course, there's a separation between biological tissues. We'll refer to those in a moment. 
and here is their densities. There's definitely a relationship that as the density increases, we have speed increases. And that's simply because the particles are closer together uh, at a molecular level, and so the energy of the sound transfers more readily as the density increases. So what is acoustic impedance? Well, let's break it down. Acoustic comes from the word acousticos, which just simply means sound. Impedance, of course, means opposition. So you're looking at a term that refers to slowing down of sound. So acoustic impedance is an object's resistance to the movement of a wave, and in particular, a sound. Now, it has the symbol Z, and it is a combination of two variables. The first variable is this one, and this refers to the density of the material. This value here refers to the velocity of the material. So acoustic impedance is very simply the multiplication of our densities that we had before and our velocities that we had before. So here we are. Here we have our speed or our velocity. Here we have our density. And then what we do is we multiply those two together and we get a value. Now, initially you're looking, oh, hold on, that value does not equal that times that. But the unit is listed here. But often we refer to acoustic impedance to a power of 10 to the power of 6. So this times this gives you that value times 10 to the power of 6. People who quote numbers here in terms of acoustic impedance understand that the unit is given to kilograms per meter squared per second times 10 to the power of 6. And so what we in essence get is an almost an amplification effect here. So because this value is getting bigger and this value is getting bigger, then clearly acoustic impedance values are getting bigger as well. The next thing we need to discuss is what happens when a wave meets a boundary. Now, you're probably already familiar with the fact that when light encounters a medium, it refracts and therefore it bends towards the normal. But we're interested not so much in terms of the refraction part, we're interested in what happens to all of the wave as it passes through. So here is a wave and it encounters the medium at this boundary. Now, most of you are aware, of course, as we've said, the wave refracts and so bends towards the normal. But not all of the wave's energy passes through the material. Some of it, of course, also reflects. Now, if we were to use the example of light encountering a glass pane, then you know that light passes through it. But you can see a little bit of reflection in the glass, and that's simply because some of the light is reflected off the surface. Not all the light is passed through. What is important to understand, though, is that when we have this going in, that the total energy is conserved. So the amount that is transmitted, that is over here, so we say this is transmission, adds up the amount that is reflected. That's simply law of conservation of energy. The total energy must be equal to the total energy after the encounter with the boundary. But the amount that actually bound the amount that actually passes through and the amount that's reflected, it depends on the nature of the two substances where the boundary exists. So in this case, we may have a lot, like glass, we may have a lot of transmission, but only a little bit of reflection. But in terms of sound, that is actually a little bit different. So for example, if there is a huge difference between the acoustic impedances of the substance where it's coming from compared to the substance where the sound is going to, then we might find actually very little is transmitted and most of it is reflected. If we're dealing with acoustic impedance, the amount of transmission to reflection depends on the impedances of the two materials. Now let's explore that a little bit further. This R value here is simply equal to the fraction of reflection. The I subscript R refers to the intensity, and that's what the I stands for, the intensity of the reflection. And the I naught refers to the total intensity that you had to begin with. 
The Z should be familiar, of course, and the Z's refer to the acoustic impedance. The Z values can simply be quoting the value in the tables. You don't have to insert the times 10 to the power of 6. You would if you wanted to use the correct SI unit, but because we are doing a ratio, the 10 to the power of 6 is not important. But I want to highlight something here, first mathematically, and in a second I'll highlight it in a more diagrammatic fashion. If there's a very large difference between the acoustic impedances of the two substances, you can see that this value here will tend to be reasonably a good size. So if this was five and this is one, you'd still have a larger number over here. Here, of course, the values are added and then it's squared. So for example, if I have very big differences between my two substances where the boundary exists, I'm going to get a larger fraction over here that is reflected. And then because of that's a large amount that's reflected, that means the very little will actually pass through. The amount of transmission will be less. But if there is a lot of similarity between the two substances, so for example, I might have sound entering a jelly and then going into water, the acoustic impedances are fairly similar. This value will start to tend to zero which means the actual value here is low, the intensity here will be large, and then the amount that is reflected is going to be a lot smaller, which means we're going to get more transmission of sound. Now, why is that important? Here, I'm going to see what happens when we fire sound into a substance, and there are two different substances that the sound might encounter. Now, that's classic what happens in an ultrasound. We have sound waves entering a body, at the skin level, but you want to get imaging off the bones and the structures inside it. And that requires the reflection. You need to somehow detect what's reflected, not what's transmitted. And of course, in this case, I've got reflection of two boundaries. And so what we have here is we have a very large difference between the outside and inside, and we have a large proportion that is reflected off. In other words, because there's a difference here that, that is reasonably large between the acoustic impedances, then the amount reflected is large. But that means less is passed through. Now, of course, a certain portion is passed through, and if enough is passed through, then we're going to get a second encounter at a boundary here. And what I've got here is representing something that is similar from the outside to the inside. So I'm going to get more transmission and I'm going to get less reflection. But of course, in an ultrasound image, you want to have both signals. This gives you a strong signal at this boundary and it's going to give you a weak signal at this boundary simply because the amount that's reflected is less. Again, if you did the calculations, you will note that the R value for this situation will be high simply because of this relationship over here. But here the R value will be a lot smaller simply again because of this relationship here. In order to get some imaging from the inside, in other words, at the boundaries over here, you need some transmission. So if this difference here was really, really large, then what would happen is that the vast majority gets reflected. Very little gets transmitted, which means you're not going to get much of a signal at this boundary over here. If you've ever had an ultrasound, you know one of the things that they do is they put some jelly on your skin before they place the transducer, which is the object that releases sound waves, in order to increase the amount of transmission. It's not to make it nice and smooth and sticky. It's simply to remove the air gap between the object that produces the sound and the skin so that the vast amount of sound waves that are produced by the transducer actually pass through the skin and are able to therefore get a signal inside the body. So now what I would like you to do is I want you to do some calculations. And we're going to do one together first, and we're going to do air and tissue boundary first. But I want you to work out how much is reflected and therefore how much is transmitted at these interfaces. So let's do this one together. We know that the fraction of reflection is equal to Z2 minus Z1, all squared, divided by Z2 plus Z1, all squared. Now, the tissue of what we're going to use here is going to have a acoustic impedance of 1.66. And of course, air is 0 
0.0004. Of course, that is squared. Then we have 1.66 plus 0 0.0004 squared. Now, if you do the calculation, you're going to get a value of 0 0.999. What does that mean? That means 99.9% .9 of the energy, of the sound energy, encountering the boundary is reflected. That means only 0.1% is actually transmitted. Which means very little of the sound waves is going to enter the, the rest of the body because you require uh, reflections from what is transmitted through it. Go ahead, now do these examples as well and answer this question as well. And I'll leave this up for you. So, if you've worked out the answers, you will get these values. Of course, we have done this one already. For part B, you're going to get 22% reflected. Same thing here for C. Notice here that the variation does not matter which way you're going to construct your answer. You're going to get the same result. And finally, tissue muscle. As you can see, there is very little difference between the acoustic impedances of these two materials and you get 0.01. Um, before you go on, some of you may be confused by the way I've recorded the acoustic impedances. I've used the correct SI units in this case, but E stands for times 10 to the power of, and so this actually says four by 10 to the power of two. It's just a way of simply recording without using indices uh, a value. So if you use Excel, for example, and you type in four E with a plus two beside it, then that's what Excel will know what you're saying. Any case, I hope that has helped you understand acoustic impedance a little bit better. In my subsequent videos, I talk about the piezoelectric effect, how the sound is generated, and I also go to the concepts of A scans and B scans in determining images using what we've just discussed. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Please share and like and might put a comment down the below if you particularly like the video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.